It's 2006, and both Irons and Slater are paddling for a colossal wave. The air is thick with tension. Both surfers have been waiting for this one moment. For this was the hottest rivalry in the history of surfing. He started getting real brash and right in my face a lot of times. <laughs> the outcome of which changed surfing forever. And not in the way you'd expect. Here's what led up to this moment, and how surfing will never be the same. Yeah, he said, that's, you catch the best wave, you're going to win. And that's really what it boils down to. You can go out there and surf like Dane Reynolds every heat, but if you're not going to get the best waves, you're not going to win your heats. When Kelly Slater walked past a thousand fans at Bells Beach, Australia in April 2006 at Bells Beach, everyone was buzzing just because he was there. At 34, the surf legend just couldn't quit. You'd wonder what else he had to prove. He won his first world title in 1992. Uh, that's, uh... That's pretty difficult because um, Tom Curran has been three-time world champion. He, he won the world title surfing through the trials contest. The youngest ever at 20. By the time he called it quits six years later, he had bagged five more titles, making him the richest and most famous surfer out there. He was the face of surfing, popping up everywhere, modeling for Versace, hitting the golf course with Sylvester Stallone, opening for Pearl Jam with his band, the surfers and even showing up on Baywatch and dating Pamela Anderson. But when Slater made his comeback in 2003, the world of surfing had undergone a massive change. When Slater jumped back into the competition in 2003, it seems like the rookie Andy Irons had challenged him to come back. You know, Andy drew that out of me, you know? He drew that, like, desire again. Many thought Slater was just tipping his toes back in, seeing how the new generation measured up. Irons outdid Slater that year, especially at the Bunzai Pipeline in Oahu. Slater had a tough next season, but bounced back in 2005, beating Irons and winning a seventh title, now as the oldest world champ ever. It felt like the old pro, knocked down by defeat, pulled off one last amazing win. The Bells Beach Contest, the Rip Curl Pro, was only the second stop on the 2006 World Contest Tour, and Slater already looked worn out. Through it really small beach break and then we had a couple of small waves at Vidaka. Looking thin, tired, and not quite himself, he seemed out of place next to the 27-year-old Andy Irons, his athletic build, and blonde hair. Just a week before, Slater had missed a contest because of contracting a virus. However, rumors swirled that he'd skipped it to find better waves, though no one had spotted him surfing, which was unusual. Then whispers began about trouble in paradise with his high-profile relationship with supermodel Giselle Bündchen. People always say you're very lucky if you love more than once, you know? Like, some people don't even ever have one love, you know? So I had one love. It was a good one. Suggesting he'd been traveling in an attempt to win her back. Now, Slater's romantic woes seemed to deeply affect his performance. He had previously left a contest to try and salvage his relationship with Pamela Anderson, and a similar heartache contributed to his loss of the 2003 world title to Irons. While it was easy to speculate that Bungeon's situation affected Slater's mood, a lot of people saw Irons as the real catalyst for Slater's current state. After all, Irons was the first surfer to openly challenge Slater with both words and performance, which ultimately reignited Slater's competitive spirit. While Slater's contemporaries from the 90s had retired, he was still striving for excellence, driven by a rivalry with Irons. Conquering the surfing world in his 20s was one thing, but the ongoing challenge presented by Irons kept pushing Slater to aim for new heights. Going, and that way it came in. And I was just like, all right. Despite the increasing toll it took on him. Now, in surf competitions, judges score each ride from 1 to 10, focusing on surfers who pull off bold, controlled moves on the most challenging parts of the wave with speed, power, and flow. This setup makes these contests a mix of precision and showmanship, somewhat like gymnastics meets, but with more competitiveness. During the events at Bells Beach, the draw was set up so Kelly Slater and Andy Irons, the top finishers from the previous season, would not face each other until the finals, if they both got there. However, their heats were scheduled back to back. Slater chose to surf a less contested part of the beach, managing just enough to win his heat before quickly leaving the scene. Irons, on the other hand, took to the heart of the action, attacking a large wave with a blend of aggression and flair that's captivating to watch. His performance was so outstanding that he scored a perfect 10, a feat rarely seen in surf competitions. This display was exactly what Slater needed to kickstart his competitive spirit, 
By the end of the day, he was seen heading to the beach, visibly more energized and seemingly provoked by Ion's perfect score. He even asked a passerby about what Ion's did to earn that score, not really waiting for a response before he dashed into the waves. This scenario wasn't new to those familiar with Slater's career. He has always thrived on challenges that ignite his drive to compete, often leading to remarkable comebacks. Shane Beshan learned this the hard way in the 90s. His sponsor had run an ad that was meant to stoke competitive fire between him and Slater, playing on a previous contest's controversy. Beshan had aimed to prove himself in their next head-to-head -head match, but Slater, fueled by the perceived challenge, outperformed him dramatically. Slater has mentioned in his autobiography that such provocations motivate him, noting the irony in how a comment meant to unsettle him ended up being a catalyst for his victory, leaving his opponents not finding the situation as amusing as he did. Andy Irons, despite his youth and confidence, couldn't outdo Slater in Tahiti, taking second place. I think that became an obsession for my brother, and he wanted to not only beat the best, he wanted to destroy him. You see, during his dominance in the 90s, Kelly Slater really didn't have a serious competitor. By 1998, after winning his sixth title, he lost his drive and decided to retire. That's when Andy Irons came onto the scene, the same year Slater stepped back. It wouldn't change how I feel. Um, I don't know if it would change the uh, decision I make in the end or not. Irons and Slater were alike in two big ways. They both had incredible natural talent and a fierce determination to win. But at the same time, they were perfect opposites as well. Slater was all about being healthy and positive, while Irons hung out with a group known as the Wolfpack, which was infamous for pushing out anyone new at the surf spots on Oahu's North Shore. Slater had a sleek, agile build and always kept cool under pressure. Irons was bigger, still carrying a bit of youthful weight, with a look of pure, untamed energy. Slater played it smart, always finding a way to use his opponent's weaknesses against them. Irons, on the other hand, was just unstoppable, too bold to be scared off. You can see the difference in these two by the way they grew up. Slater was born in 1972 at Cape Canaveral Hospital, Cocoa Beach. He grew up splitting his time between a burger hut where his mum worked and his dad's bait shop. His dad was a talented surfer but struggled with alcohol, leading to a tough childhood for Slater filled with verbal abuse and risky situations. Yet, there were good times too, like fishing in Florida's canals and shooting with a pellet gun. Slater's parents split up in the 80s. This tough time seemed to fuel Slater's resolve to live a different life. By the late 90s, he was earning millions with Quicksilver. He was also known for being polite and clean-cut. Slater wasn't just talented, he was innovative and strategic. He studied the contest rules inside and out, looking for any edge. He even kept tabs on competitors' average scores to know exactly what he needed to beat them. If someone scored high, Slater knew he had to push harder, often leading them to make mistakes. Ian's upbringing was different. Raised in Kauai by a surfer father and a mother who worked in a surf shop, Ian's and his brother were beachbound from a young age. Turning professional after high school, Ian's quickly made a name for himself, though his early career was marked by a struggle with the party lifestyle that came with the pro tour. This phase nearly derailed his career, but Irons viewed his comeback as his greatest achievement, even more so when he beat Slater in competition for the first time. Their rivalry was more than just about surfing, it was a clash of lifestyles and mindsets. Slater, the methodical and focused competitor versus Irons, who was always on the edge yet undeniably talented. Irons' victory over Slater at the 2000 Pipeline Masters and his subsequent world title win in 2002 signaled a shift, challenging Slater's dominance. And when Slater returned to the tour in 2003, their rivalry intensified, with Irons openly declaring his intention to dethrone Slater. The tension reached its peak in 2004, when Irons, overwhelmed by emotion, destroyed his surfboard after a loss. Now, no surfing contest on Earth matters more than the Pipeline Masters. Pipeline, with its shallow reef and powerful waves right off an Oahu beach, is notorious. It's a place where the waves pack so much punch they've caused serious injuries and even deaths. Outside of competitions, Pipeline's locals can be pretty protective of their waves. There's an unwritten rule about who gets to surf which wave, and back then, Iron's crew, the Wolfpack, usually ruled the spot. But on the day before the 2003 Pipeline Masters, while the other contestants warmed up in the water, Slater claimed wave after wave for himself, behaving like the undisputed king of the beach. 
Although there is some disagreement about exactly what went down in the water that day, a lot of people reported Andy screaming at Slater, who infuriated Irons further by telling him to calm down and get a grip on himself. It was clear he was trying to get under Iron's skin, a bit out of character for someone known for valuing good manners. But Slater's alleged plan didn't work. Irons disposed of one opponent after another throughout the contest, until it came down to him and Slater in the final. Then it happened. As Irons warmed up on the beach, Slater slid up next to him and wrapped an arm around his shoulders and whispered, I love you, man. Irons, however, wasn't buying it. He thought Slater was playing mind games. He went up to Andy and put his arm around him and he was like, I love you. And Andy looked at him like, what? Something Slater was known for. But according to Slater, that wasn't his intention at all. He was just trying to say, let's enjoy this. It's been a tough year and I'm beat. I wasn't taken the way that I meant it. I was a little, a little bummed that I even said it. Irons had every reason to suspect mind games, though. Slater had a reputation for using psychological tactics, like when he suggested to his friend Shane Dorian that they start heat surfing in a completely different stance. But Irons was unshakable, a surfer who stood his ground no matter the challenge, whether it was small waves in Japan or the intense atmosphere of the Pipe Masters. While many surfers got thrown off by Slater's tricks, Irons remained focused. Winning both the contest and the world title, he achieved something no one else had against Slater in a one-on-one -on -one matchup. After the competition, Slater lingered in the water by himself, while Irons celebrated his victory with the crowd, and later shared an emotional moment alone at Jack Johnson's place. Later, the two surfers found themselves together again, waiting to speak to the media. Irons playfully hit Slater on the back, signaling a readiness to compete again next year. This gesture hinted at their ongoing rivalry and respect for each other, despite the intense competition. Irons clinched the world title again in 2004, his third, joining the ranks of surfing legends like Slater, Mark Richards, and Tom Curran. But Slater was already regrouping. He saw his 2003 defeat as a reflection of various personal challenges, rather than Irons' superior surfing skills. Slater was dealing with a lot at the time, including the loss of his father to throat cancer in 2002 and efforts to mend fences with his family and an ex-girlfriend, along with getting to know a daughter he hadn't been close to. He admitted that these personal issues had taken a toll on him, especially during the competitions. As 2005 rolled around, Slater was on the hunt for something to reignite his competitive fire and boost his confidence for another shot at the world title. He found his answer at Tiahupu in Tahiti, known for its incredibly dangerous waves. Right before a crucial heat, an encounter with his old friend, big wave surfer Brock Little, provided the spark Slater needed. Little's simple question about winning stirred something in Slater, giving him the push he needed to aim for victory again. Over the following months, Slater and Andy Irons went back and forth, winning contests from Tahiti to Brazil. Their rivalry was so intense that a single heat in France attracted 650,000 live webcast viewers. By the time they got to Brazil in October, Slater had a chance to clinch his seventh world title. Although he was knocked out early, he stayed to watch Irons compete. When Irons lost, Slater, hiding his tension under his jacket, realized he'd won the title. By April 2006 at Bells Beach, the waves were massive. Irons, who had learned a lot from watching Slater, couldn't match Slater's strategic consistency. Slater advanced to the final by sticking to his strategy and outperforming his competitors, including Joel Parkinson in the final. Facing huge waves, Slater executed a risky maneuver that paid off with a near-perfect score, proving he was still at the top of his game. However, Slater hid an injury he sustained during that ride, and not long after, he was injured again in Tahiti. Um, I would say that injury was probably more painful and longer-lasting than the than the bone break. This opened a window for Irons, who seized the opportunity by winning the next time they met in Mexico. And that brings us to the competition that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the 2006 Rip Curl Pro Pipeline Masters. Slater, as expected, took an early lead, scoring a 9 and a 7.4 after skillfully navigating both a pipeline left and a backdoor right. He didn't stop there, pushing ahead with an 8.53 for an incredible backdoor barrel that had him powering through a huge section of the wave. The crowd was already cheering for Slater, thinking he was back on track to add another Pipe Master title to his collection. However, what happened next took everyone by surprise. Irons wasn't just ready to stand by and watch Slater win. 
he started to catch up with some jaw-dropping rides of his own. Still, he needed a 9.1 to catch Slater, which seemed a tall order until he caught a solid wave set. Taking off deep inside, Irons free fell down the wave's face, managed to hold his edge, and then flew through an incredible tube, emerging to the roar of the crowd. His score? A 9.87, putting him in the lead. Slater fought back with another amazing ride through a backdoor barrel, scoring an 8.73. Close, but not enough to retake the lead. The tension was palpable as they jockeyed for position. Irons found another backdoor wave, dropping in with a finesse that belied the difficulty, navigating a barrel that would have overwhelmed most. Shooting out into the open, he was greeted with perfect tens from the judges, clinching the win. The victory at the Pipeline Masters was a triumphant moment for Irons marking an incredible end to the year and a clear statement of his intent to challenge Slater for the world title, aiming to reclaim the crown Slater had taken from him in 2005.